why is history important for the Christian and for the Christian faith? Well, I think it is very basic to the nature of Christian faith, isn't it? If we believe in Jesus Christ, and just to say the word Jesus means we're referring to someone who lived in first century history. Right. Um, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we're believing that God has revealed himself and God has worked out our, our salvation in history by really becoming a historical person in first century Palestinian history. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how we know who Jesus is, I think. We right. read the Gospels to know that who Jesus is, and we assume that the Gospels are reliable history if we want to know who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. um, we then know him, of course, as a living Lord. But if that were all we did, it could very easily be that Jesus was a kind of symbol that we could manipulate and make into right. any, any kind of form that we wanted, you know? Um, but the living Lord is the same Jesus who lived and who died on the cross and ro rose from the mm -hmm. dead, you know? So that uh, that story is, is who he is. It's, it belongs to who he is, and, and that's how we can really know him and relate to him. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people get confused about the difference between history as in a series of events that happened back then, back there, mm. and written history. Yes. If you were to articulate for them how to view the difference between what actually happened and then how it was written up yes. later, how would you articulate that? Yes, of course we never have any access to the events no. unless, unless we have actually lived through them. Right. Um, and ancient historians, of course, valued most of all the, the evidence of people who had lived through the events. Right, the eyewitnesses. First hand eyewitnesses, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but we never have the events as such, and even if we live through them, of course, we are interpreting them for ourselves. We're, we're right. seeing significance in them. Mm -hmm. We sort of unconsciously even choose what to remember. We don't remember everything we can't, you know? No. We remember a selection of, of the key things that right. happened. Yeah. And history is ine inevitably like that. Um, so we have history as a blend of real fact and real interpretation. I right. mean, it's not as though you've got the fact and then you come up with some interpretation. Right. It's the interpretation that the fact demands, right. if you think about it. Right. But when, when we look at it that way, I mean, anybody in the first century could have said, and Jesus died on a cross under Pontius Pilate. Yes. This is just a Indeed. basic fact Indeed. about his life. Indeed. But when a gospel writer says, for example, Jesus died for my sins under Pontius Pilate, then there's a theological interpretation of the meaning of that historical fact. Absolutely. The two come together, they're not sort of easily separable. Yes, yes, yes. So when a first century Christian was witnessing about the history of Jesus, presumably they could never just say, well, here are the facts, no. what do you think about no. this? No. They were always going to present it as good news through a certain kind of theological interpretation. Yes. Uh, Ernst Bloch, the great Marxist philosopher, said thousands of people died on crosses in, in the Roman Empire. What's special about this man? You know, why should we remember this man? Mm -hmm. And But we do remember this man. We've forgotten most of the others. Um, this man, we have a, an account of his crucifixion, mm -hmm. more detailed and full than any account of any other crucifixion in the ancient world. Right. So, so they saw something special in this. Um, and yes, they came to see that God was acting in that event for the salvation of human, human beings to save us from sin. Um, and that it came out of, didn't it, uh, the context of Jesus' own teaching and ministry right. leading up to the cross, so it, the cross wasn't an isolated event. I think it's totally important, you know. Mm -hmm. We don't understand the cross if we isolate it from right. the rest of the story of Jesus that it belongs in. Right. Um, and also, of course, the scriptures of Israel. And the early Christians did a great deal of that, reading the story of Jesus in the light of the scriptures of Israel. Jesus had already himself pointed to the scriptures of Israel as mm -hmm. the, the key to what he was doing, um, and reread the, re -read the scriptures in the light of what had happened. So, yes, there's a lot of deep theological thinking going on. Mm -hmm. But about real historical events, I mean, it wouldn't have made any sense, I think, if they were just making up the story because they were talking about what, what God had really done in history. And they probably would certainly not have made up this particular uh, story since crucifixion 
was seen as the most shameful way Absolutely. to die. I mean, what kind of God is so silly that it gets itself crucified? Yes. I mean, yes. how, how could that be the story that you wanted to tell as good news? Yes. Yes. So, I mean, there, there are certain elements in the story that are so offensive uh, that, that, I mean, I think you, get, you quickly think, well, this must be historical bedrock. Yes. We must be to the bottom of the well here because you wouldn't make up a story and start yeah. a new r world religion on this kind of idea, Absolutely. surely. Yeah. Pagan intellectuals, of course, were ten tended to think Christianity was just ridiculous because the idea of a God dying on the cross, you know, it's, it's risible. Um, right. um, so it wasn't a message that, as it were, was made to fit the ancient world in that sense. Um, it was a message that they just found themselves with and had to proclaim. Um, and I think there was a great element of, of feeling they had to tell people about this, where it came to them, you know, mm -hmm. changed their own lives, as, as it were, drove them to, to proclaim this message. How would you, when people today hear about things like the Jesus Seminar or the quest for the historical Jesus and all of that, and then raise huge questions about the relationship between the historical Jesus and the Christ mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. faith. Mm -hmm. um, how would you help the layperson or the pastor to, to parse some of those kinds of discussions yes. And, yes. and find something useful in all that? Should, yes. we really, should we really see the Christological stuff as kind of like robes Mm -hmm. put on a, a historical figure who was mm -hmm. interesting, mm -hmm. who was a prophetic figure, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day wasn't all the, the early church thought mm -hmm. he was mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. Easter, mm -hmm. or should we um, have a higher view of Jesus' own Christology and the mm -hmm. way he presented himself? How, how mm -hmm. would you mm -hmm. help them see mm -hmm. that issue? We, we, we should, certainly should have a higher view of the way Jesus presented himself. Um, I mean, I think there's an issue of historical method there. Right. That the kind of method that the Jesus Seminar and I mean, quite a lot of other questers for the historical Jesus, as you know, they're called in the trade, um, has been the method of taking every little bit of the gospel tradition, you know, every saying, every story, mm -hmm. and trying to assess whether it's authentic historical tradition, uh, piece by piece. And it has tremendous potential for simply picking out the bits you like and creating, you know, any sort I of knew Jesus. Jesus. That's right. And if you look at the results of this method, you just get example after example of different Jesuses. It simply hasn't produced any kind of stable result. Right. Right. So I think that method is bankrupt. But the other thing to say about it is it's very odd as a historical method. Yeah. What, his, what historians usually do is assess the general reliability of a source. Right. And then you trust the source and has you really good reason to doubt it. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to Which get... Which is just the opposite way around than starting with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Yes. And then it has to prove itself innocent, even though you're starting with the assumption it's Absolutely. guilty and not yes. telling you the yes. truth. Yes, yes. So we need to start with the Gospels that we have and, right. and think about what sort of right. evidence are they. Uh, do they go back to eyewitnesses, um, which is what I've tried to argue in my Jesus and the Eyewitnesses book. Um, and if we, if we reach uh, a, a high opinion of Mark's Gospel, shall we say, as a historical source, then we don't have to ask, did he get this little bit right and did he get that little bit right? We haven't got the information to do that. What we have got right. is the ability the to assess picture. the source. And you know, I think the historical method that has been neglected, but is so potent really in this field, is simply to ask whether the Gospels fit their historical setting in the ministry of Jesus, the historical setting mm -hmm. they purport to tell us about. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things that the scholarship of the last 50 years has done is to tell us so much more about early Jewish Palestine, the, the, right. the, the society in which Jesus right. lived. So there are all manner of ways of checking all kinds of things in the Gospels, because they are stories that are constantly referring sometimes almost by the way to features of their context, you know. Right. And we can check these things. Right. Um, and they are so different from the Gnostic Gospels, you know, the later Gospels, right. in which you simply get Jesus appearing out of nowhere and teaching. Right. There's no historical Jesus detail. Jesus the talking head. That's right. No historical detail, no geography, no reference to, you know, what's going on in that society. Mm -hmm. Nothing you can check it by historically. Right. But the Gospels in the New Testament are very different. I mean, they're just full of all this stuff that more and more, it's quite obvious, it does fit. 
into the first half of the first century Jewish Palestine. I must say one of the things that have always bewildered me about a highly skeptical reading of the Gospel, which is very confident that it can reconstruct a community to which this Gospel was written, and then in fact this is sort of coded language to deal with the crises of this particular community 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years after the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm when what we know about the later Christian communities doesn't suggest they sat around and wrung their hands about things like Korban mm -hmm. or, yes. uh, you know, some of early Jewish mm -hmm. discussions mm -hmm. you see Jesus mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. about leveret marriage and mm -hmm. this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, where really is the evidence that mm -hmm. the later Christian community was exercised about some of those things? And yet, they are at the heart of the debates at Indeed. various points yes. Uh, yes. in the Gospels. I mean, yes. You know, where do you have an argument in Paul about paying the temple tax? Well, not really. Mm. He just assumes they're going to pay their taxes, you yep. know. And so a lot of the things that seem to be hot topics for Jesus and, and in that early um, Palestinian Jewish setting yes. are so not topics for yeah. the audience of the Gospel yeah. of Mark or yeah. whoever. Yeah. Because one of the things Jesus was doing clearly was engaging with other Jewish teachers. Right. Um, and. He had his own distinctive things, which he taught, mm -hmm. and he taught the disciples, but he was also doing this other thing, talking to the mm -hmm. Pharisees. I think in some ways he was discussing with the Pharisees because they were closest to him. Um, the Essenes, you know, the people who wrote the Qumran scrolls, don't appear in the Gospels because they were sort of way off the scene, really. They, they mm -hmm. were s sort of sectarian. They weren't involved in the discussions. Uh, that went on in the places Jesus frequented. So Jesus had to be involved with the Pharisees. And uh, he's dealing with the issues that if we, if we look at the traditions about the Pharisees in rabbinic literature, he's dealing with the things that mattered to the Pharisees right. um, and needed to be dealt with. Right. One of the things, uh, you know, when you talk about a truncated view of Jesus, I mean, of course, there's the liberal Jesus that wants to just uh, reduce him to the teacher of parables or some kind of prophet or something like that. But at the other end of the spectrum, you have conservative Christians that say, well, all of this history is not all that important. What really matters is that Jesus came, that he died on the cross, that he rose again. I mean, those are the salvific moments about Jesus. He came and, and he died and he rose again. That's the real gospel. All of these parables and beatitudes and this miracle and that miracle, well, we could have been saved if he had not done that sort of stuff. What would you say mm. to that kind mm. of uh, conservative misreading mm. of the I, Gospels? I would say, well, why do we have the Gospels? You know, we, we, could, have that, we, we, we could have that in much shorter form. Um, well, we do, in some ways in Acts or in Paul. Yes, yes, indeed, yes. Um, but the Gospels, the Gospels themselves have always been at the heart of Christian experience and life and practice mm -hmm. and so on, haven't they? Um, and actually, I think there's something about our, our contemporary context, you know, what appeals to people in the Gospel uh, out, out there. Um, and I think that what comes across as a rather abstract message is not that appealing to, to many people. Right. The, the concrete figure of Jesus in the Gospels, you know, again and again simply proves attractive. And people read the Gospels, they encounter this man who's teaching mm -hmm. all these things, and they're simply drawn to him. Mm -hmm. And if we leave that out, I think, you know, we, we, again, we're leaving Jesus out, really. We're just saying a couple of things that happened to Jesus. Um, but I don't think we can understand those couple of things, the cross and the resurrection, Without, um, the, fuller with, without the whole story. Or we can't understand him because we don't have the fuller picture of his character by his words. A and absolutely, deeds. yes. Right. Yes, yes. Um, you know, one of the things that has happened in the last 15 or 20 years is Western culture has become more and more skeptical about mm -hmm. Christianity and Jesus is we actually even have the rise of the did Jesus even exist movement. I, I have to say that, I mean, for me, I, I almost become incredulous when I hear that kind of question, when I read something like, oh, say Galatians 1 and 2 from Paul. Paul says, you know, I had this experience on Damascus Road, and then I went up to Jerusalem to talk to the pillar apostles, Peter and James and John, and we had these discussions, and you may be sure they weren't talking about the weather. I mean, now here's somebody who was a contemporary of yes. the original apostles. Yes. Um, uh, how do you think it's even possible for people to raise the question, did Jesus exist, when you have contemporary eyewitnesses uh, not only talking as mm. though Jesus exists, but 
being quite adamant, yes, yes he existed, yes. and I'm actually prepared to die yes, yes. for what I believe about this historical person. Yes, I, yes. What, what do you think drives people to that degree of adamant yes. rejection of any kind of historical existence yes, of Jesus? Yes, it, it's hard to say, isn't it, what lies behind it. It is, it is as you say, extraordinary. And it does depend on a huge amount of misinformation that's right. out there. You know, um, people really believe that our gospels were written late second century, third century, even that Constantine had something to right. do with it. Well, it's right. complete nonsense. I mean, you won't find any reputable scholar who would, who would uh, give no. any countenance to those right. kind of views. But um, some of it, of course, started with the Da Vinci Code. Yeah. And of course, it's, it's part of, I, I think there's a kind of phenomenon of modern culture that you can read certain websites and as you were constantly reinforce your very illusory view of, of things by, right. by just interacting right. with a few other people who have these these views. Richard Dawkins denies Jesus exists and he has a footnote to some very strange website. How can a, 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 a reputable scientist, which he is mm -hmm. in his own field, moving into this field trust that sort of authority for it? Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary. Um, but we have got to, got, to, got to get across to people that New Testament scholars are doing real history. Right. You know, um, and that uh, we are using good historical method. We're, we're, we're not just propagandists, you know, who are making up history. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to get people, I think, a little bit involved in seeing what we're actually doing yeah. um, for them to understand that. And you've got to get people actually to kind of understand how history works and how you know historical things. Um, I think some people, too, at the end of the day, are looking for permission to not have to reckon with Jesus. Oh, yes. Or yes. to take him seriously. Yes. yes. Anything that helps them keep him at arm's length yes. and not make a claim on them or yes. their lives, they're, yes. they're happy with that. I, when I did a book tour in reg in my, with my little book that was a response to the Da Vinci Code called The Gospel Code, and I went all over the country speaking about this, one of the number one reactions I got was, really? You mean the Da Vinci Code is not telling us the truth? Page one said everything written in this is a fact, grounded in history and all of that. And I mean, just the naivete about the willingness to believe the Da Vinci Code, in, which has 150 or more errors in regard to history in it. You know, I, I came off, to that, off of that tour, and even church people, I came off, off of that tour thinking, oh my goodness, I should write this up and call it Gullible's Travels. I mean, it, it, if you don't seriously engage with the historical tradition, you can believe almost anything about it. Yes. Almost anything about it. Uh, and, absolutely. And convince yourself that it's true. Yes, yes. And, I, you know, I, in some ways I thought, well, here's why history matters. Yes, yes. History matters because you're not allowed to recreate Jesus in your own image. Yes. History matters because he actually makes a claim on us and not just vice versa. Um, and so historical research matters because we have a historical religion. Yes, yes, I agree. So.